Thanks for coming. My name is Charles and I work at Automatic, which is kind of the parent company, if you will, of WordPress. But I wanted to make mention of both my telephone number, 444219316, and a Twitter handle. Uh, I was just going to ask a couple of questions during the presentation if anyone's more comfortable with just uh, doing text or uh, Twitter, then feel free to chime in that way. And I'll also kind of leave that up there for any subsequent discussions. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to put this up here just kind of to give you a sense of the company behind WordPress. We usually have a collective gathering uh, every year where everybody gets together and just talks about what's going on and a good time for face to face. Uh, but before I go into a deeper discussion of uh, distributed diversity and life at Automatic, I just wanted to give kind of an acknowledgement that uh, we're in Atlanta, Georgia. We're kind of uh, kind of inhabiting the space, building upon the work that the uh, Muskogee and the work that the Cherokee did to make this a habitable space. And also, if you'd gone back 50 years ago, last Monday, just down the street that way, uh, we were all, um, you know, kind of commemorating Dr. King's passing. His funeral took place a couple of blocks that way. So, I say that to just kind of give my context. I grew up in Atlanta, and I'm kind of one of the older people <laughs> now in the community. I was old enough to have witnessed uh, the events around his passing. So I want to jump into Automatic now. Uh, I've been there for about two years, and one of the great things about it is that you get to um, hang out and work at a very welcoming company. As you can kind of see from the photo here, there's a lot of work that I think has been done at least on gender uh, inclusion in the company. So I, I think that's a, a thing that's to be praised. And the company is also distributed in the sense that we work all over the globe. So I'm a data scientist there and a lot of my colleagues work in, in uh, Europe. Uh, there's a colleague that I work with quite closely who's based in Israel. Uh, there's another colleague who's based in Australia. So distributed companies can work, they can be effective at doing important things in the world. Uh, and that gets to one of the things that is most important for me about um, being an automatic, and I'll come back to it later, which is being able to have kind of the world as your office place. So this is a photograph I recently took uh, of my office for the day, which is at a coffee shop here in Atlanta. Uh, I drop my kids off to school, and I find a place to work, and I can, you know, listen to stories going on in the background. I can listen to the birds chirping. Uh, I get to kind of create my own space to do work in. And I'm communicating with people all over the world, literally. I think that's very empowering, and I'll get back to that also. But I think that empathy for this company plays a large role in making it work, in the sense that when we first start at Automatic, everyone does what's called a support or happiness rotation, as in the first three, work, three weeks of work are uh, listening to or taking live chats about how the products are doing. Uh, the first three weeks are actually understanding how people are experiencing uh, the various WordPress.com, 
uh, products and answering questions about them. So this is a screenshot I took of an internal um, memo it says, if you can read it, February Empathy Challenge. It was put out by the lead of our mobile group, Kate Houston. Basically the sense of getting into the design of the WordPress application and understanding how the people that are using it are experiencing it in order to really build some empathy with the users, with the designers that are making this thing happen. Here's another um, screenshot of uh, Alan, who is a uh, engineer associated with the, the uh, Gutenberg project, and he is kind of looking at uh, how the user flow in, in Gutenberg looks as a real user of it. And uh, I think the Gutenberg workshop is the competing one to this, so I have a lot of, I'm showing empathy for <laughs> Gutenberg. Okay, so all the sense that um, everything aside, I think that uh, Automatic really puts a lot of effort into uh, developing kind of external and internal empathy, trying to put yourself in the, pers the other person's um, footsteps. And this is another kind of empathy that I really like about Automatic, which is this is a photograph taken from a designer uh, hangout in Detroit in which they actually kind of went into communities uh, in Detroit and said, uh, okay, can we put up a web page for a given small business? And I think the woman in the lower uh, left hand of the screen uh, owns a business in Detroit and some you might recognize Ola here, who's co-staffing the booth with me. And they kind of came in and said, w how can we make a WordPress site work for you? And we spent the whole week um, just going around in the community in the hood, just saying, how can we get a site going for your business? And I think this, to me, shows a lot of empathy for you know, how people are experiencing the product and how we can make it work. Uh, so this is another thing I wanted to highlight, which is that uh, our head of design, John Maida, is here with uh, a high school principal in Paintsville, Kentucky, and John had the idea, well, okay, maybe we can have a design class for high schoolers there so that they come out knowing skills. And uh, just wanted to take a second here, let that thought gestate, but wanted to get a sense of why people are here. Or let me ask, I'll just ask three questions. Uh, are any people who here who work at a, rem work remotely? Okay, so maybe a good third at the... <laughs> Freelancer. <laughs> Freelancer, cool, yeah. Uh, any people here that are really actively thinking about, well, how can I make my, wherever I work, more inclusive, more diverse? Oh, okay, so it's, it's, it's in there, and so I, hopefully I can touch on some of these issues and uh, at least get a discussion going. Okay, but the, the thing I wanted to bring up with both um, you know, the experiences kind of in the community in Detroit and in my kind of uh, acknowledgement of Dr. King's work is that opportunity is still kind of uh, in the exclusive mindset. If we look around at what's come going on in our world, in our country, uh, just some graphs here. I'm a data scientist at WordPress, so I'm always being called on to put together charts, graphs, analyses for the stuff that's happening internally. Uh, so a graph just to illustrate that economic uh, opportunity in terms of just uh, salary is still kind of um, racialized in our country. Uh, black, Latino um, people just making a fraction 
um, of the pay of others in our society. Uh, if we look at kind of a measure of um, uh, economic inequality, uh, there definitely seem to be some patterns here. And Atlanta, unfortunately, scores kind of high in the uh, Gini index, which is kind of a measure of how um, you know the the economic divide of an area. So it's a kind of a uh, you know, kind of a dark uh, patch there in the Atlanta and the, um, you know, southeast, and it's kind of spread throughout the country. Uh, and just to kind of apply one racial lens to it, um, the areas, at least in the southeast, of uh, this high inequality also kind of overlap with the uh, proportion of um, African American, the African American population. Uh, let's see. So, all that to say that there, you know, exist some disparities both along racial and geographic lines. They kind of intersect, right? So, one way to think about what uh, distributed work, as in uh, the the companies that are like automatic could bring to the world, is a, a more equi equitable distribution of uh, resources, wealth, however you want to put it, right? If your opportunities are not necessarily linked to and limited by your place then maybe that opens the world up to a lot of uh, other possibilities. So I, again, I think back to the work that um, John Maida was doing, you know, actually saying that you could go out into a, a place and introduce a uh, technology as kind of an equalizer. And this, when people go out and do surveys of um, uh, women, underrepresented minorities, uh, one factor that keeps coming up, especially when you ask, well, what's, what's the most important thing about working in a place for you, uh, is that this, this notion of flexibility and work uh, comes up as a key factor. In fact, um, among 83% of uh, underrepresented um, women in the sciences and engineering, uh, the, the ability to do, um, flexi to have flexibility in work, to be able to work from wherever you want it, to be able to kind of chart the schedule that you want comes up as the most important factor. All right. Uh, so another factor kind of looking at and trying to tease out where to look for people and what to think about in terms of how uh, distributed work could have a real impact. Um, just, just thinking about where skilled people are. So as just one data point, uh, the black colleges, the historically black institutions, especially in the southeast, pay play a large role in producing uh, graduates in the sciences and engineering. So again, it's kind of a way of looking at um, you have a large population in a given area, you have um, you know, skills concentrated there. So uh, kind of bringing the work to the people, so to say, is a very powerful way of thinking about things. And, you know, if, if, you're, if you're skeptical about saying, well, um, you know, what is the value of um, equality or uh, distributed work for, uh, you know, what is the value of being more inclusive, um, then this report done by McKinsey, uh, 2015, kind of uh, hits home a point, which is our latest research finds that companies in the top quartile for gender, racial, and ethnic diversity are more likely to have 
financial returns above the national industry medians. Uh, which is to say that uh, making an effort on, for inclusion, making an effort for uh, constructing a diverse workforce, um, you know, has a benefit for everyone. And, you know, most recently, I think this is kind of the, the you know, the movie child, the poster child for what <laughs> diversity means and inclusion means in terms of profitability is the movie Black Panther. You know, kind of uh, internationally, kind of across um, all demographics, it's uh, one of the most profitable uh, movies that has been made. And again, it speaks to inclusive and diverse themes. So, you know, if we kind of broaden what our um, reach is, if we broaden inclusivity, then, you know, everyone wins. So, where are we? So, one of the discussions that I was having earlier with my colleague, especially about the Detroit hangout they did, was that, well, it's okay to go to some place and try to make a, you know, teach them development skills, so teach them about uh, putting up a WordPress site. But what happens if they don't have reliable access to the internet? What if the people they're trying to reach don't have that kind of um, access? And that's a good question. So I was try trying to think about this question in terms of the training. How much do you need to, to be able to construct um, a distributed workforce that impacts people that have been underrepresented and how much burden are you placing on them in terms of training and in terms of the resources they need to enter uh, into a, you know, a distributed company. So uh, one piece of this spectrum we have companies that we think about in terms of their distributed workforce uh, WordPress or Automatic, as I mentioned, everybody works remotely. Um, companies that you may be aware of, Mozilla, uh, the the browser. Uh, there's this search engine called DuckDuckGo, uh, and there's this company called GitHub that hosts a lot of uh, open source uh, projects. Well, these companies all have a significant number of distributed employees, people that work all over the globe. Uh, but in some sense, even for roles like product development, engineering, software development, uh, marketing, you need some skills. Maybe they can be acquired formally, informally. You know, maybe you need a college education. Maybe you need, um, you know, some some kind of technical training. It could be formal or not. But still, there's a lot of investment you need to be making in training. Uh, on one end of the resource spectrum, there's companies like Lyft. I mean, you can be a driver any place, but you need to own a car, right? Um, they'll lease you a car now, you know that? Leasing a car. They'll, give you, they'll let you use a car, but you have to reach like this threshold of fares or else you pay like a huge amount if you, if you don't make your quota. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh -huh. it's really... Yeah, there's some kind of... Yeah. Really. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, and and increasingly, you know, places like Walmart or uh, Amazon, of course, are talking about uh, creating uh, you know, kind of, I would say, hybrid workforces that, you know, some portion robots, some portion, uh, you know, people doing the restocking, people uh, handling s customer support. So there's a lot of... Um, uh, you know, stuff going on in this space. But I think that the kind of barrier to entry, you know, getting the job is less burdensome than, uh, you know, having to, you know, necessarily have the, the car or have the, um, you know, be highly credentialed. Okay. Uh, but the questions you could ask in this space are, you know, kind of stability of the job. Um, you know, what are the, the benefits you're receiving? Um, are you having to make lots of compromises in your, 
you know, other aspects of life in order to juggle, um, you know, getting it. So what's the, is the work-life equation really working out? Um, and, you know, so you could go in this other portion of the spectrum, you know, telemedicine, where, you know, you're a highly trained um, physician here and she's making a, you know, essentially a telecall. Uh, so, you know, just really a lot of things to think about. Um, and I, I think remote work is increasingly becoming uh, the thing on the horizon, but how, what questions should we be asking about it? And here, I really have more questions than answers. Um, so I just want to, this is not exactly <laughs> as... Um, visible and legible as I would hope, but I just wanted to throw up some uh, indicators and some data that we have from distributed companies about how inclusive they're making their workforce. So this may be a little hard to parse, but on the left-hand side, I have some data from GitHub, another um, you know technology uh, company, I think, uh, it's around 5% or so participation of black and Hispanic um, uh, engineers, uh, about 22%, I think, women in technical roles. It's larger for the company as a whole. Uh, GitLab is another distributed company that makes basically software, uh, a software hosting platform. And uh, the thing you'll notice here, although um, it's, uh, it, it you know, does have in the teens uh, representation of uh, black Hispanic employees, but, you know, again, it's a smaller company and the numbers are low. You can have one black technical employee and still have 12 percent, which is interesting, but you know. Uh, so in other words, there's still, um, you know, there's still this gap in between the promise of the, the work and kind of the representation there. Uh, again, this is not that legible looking at it, but um, the, the summary here is that uh, for uh, black Latino uh, college graduates in the, in the sciences engineering, uh, the rates are something like 8 to 10 percent. So it, it, it's coming towards what you expect from the overall population, but the kind of labor force participation still is going toward the 5% um, level in these kind of STEM fields. So there's still some drop off is in, um, you know, the graduates are being produced, but are they finding work in this area? And, you know, it's also, so there's also kind of a really credentialized uh, look at the, the data because, you know, I'm looking at college graduates, people that could, uh, you know, afford the tuition, have the resources to make it through college. Um, what about the people that need work um, that are perfectly capable of doing things, but, you know, how, how do they get into the pipeline for work that, um, you know, gets out of this huge uh, barriers in terms of inequality? Um, so, you know, here's another graph kind of illustrating the same point. Uh, so, I made a quick survey. I was just trying to send this out to people at the various um, uh, distributed companies to ask, well, you know, what are you doing? What are your thoughts on going forward? Uh, strange. Well, the you know, interesting thing about it, haven't had much um, feedback, but uh, I would just kind of welcome people to just dive into it. Uh, I took a site here, distributedinclusion.org, 
and you know, feel free to go to it or just dabble around in it. And how much? How's my time? You're doing great. It's uh, Oh, okay. Um, so I'm going to try to experiment. Actually, we're going to the survey, and while I'm doing that, are there any questions or you know, kind of? Yeah, I do have a question about the definition of uh, diversity. <laughs> <laughs> because here, in, I went to a nonprofit uh, diversity summit. There were three white guys and two black guys on the panel. Everybody over fifty. Nonprofits, probably mostly female employees there, um, younger. So the the audience was mostly female, younger, black, white, Hispanic, Asian. And then we had these five guys, older guys up on stage talking about the importance of inclusion. And it was ironic. Um, so from your point of view, I wonder how maybe, or maybe from Automatic's point of view, or how do you actually, because sitting in your session, that's diversity. Um, you know, looking around this conference, we see a lot of people. Huh. It's not just black and white. In Atlanta it is. In Seattle, they think about American Indian population. Right, right, like right, 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 um, right. So it's, um, oh, well, I had a nice quote there, but um, it's a complicated, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad you bring up the complexities um, of the issue when I think of, I mean, I th I've been thinking about three things lately. Um, there's the word diversity, there's the word inclusion, there's the word equity. And what I'm really trying to think about is, you know, r really the, the thing I was getting to in the beginning of the the talk, which is that um, you know King was assassinated trying to get some work done for the uh, striking garbage workers, uh, striking sanitation workers in Memphis. Um, you know, at the end of it all, uh, we're all trying to participate. We're all trying to put food on the table, educate our children. What are the barriers to getting there? And I think of uh, inclusion and equity in particular is saying that you know a as a uh, you know uh, uh, as, a, as a native person in Seattle as a young black man in Atlanta uh, you know you're, you're trying to you know really exist you're trying to fulfill your human capacity and as a society, we benefit from those human capacities being fulfilled. Uh, as a company, we benefit from having, um, you know, multiple eyes on things. When I do, when I write code, I submit it to um, a platform like GitHub, and three other developers look at it. And uh, a developer who's, you know. 20 years younger than I, in, based in Australia, may have different perspective than I would on the code. Um, when I'm trying to present a, um, you know, just a plan for three years going forward for my work, and I make a comment, um, the woman who's my manager may have a different thought about the um, structuring of those goals than I would. So I, I, I mean, I, I think that the, A, the perspectives um, play out in a real way. I think the opportunities for a company play out uh, in a real way. And I think that when you, and, and I also think that when we let artificial barriers that we've inherited, I mean, we were born into society, we can't control the fact that, um, you know, Georgia is what it is. Uh, the, the, the world we are born into, we have no control over, but we have some control over just saying, you know, you have a valid idea, you have a valid idea, why, you know, why aren't you being heard? And I, I think um, that I kind of view the inclusion as that 
um, being invited to the table, making decisions about how a company reaches out to the, the people that it wants to support. And I, I view the inclusion and equity as what are our customers need? Maybe there's a huge market that we haven't uh, identified. Um, so that's kind of how I view it. Um, you know, I think Automatic is still, like many companies, making its shift. Um, you know, so <laughs> I've been going, giving you a long-winded answer to your question, <laughs> but I'll just kind of <laughs> Hard question. <laughs> Thanks. I don't think there's one thing extra, but if you put on every one of them, I think. I mean, as a human being, we all want to be a contributing member to the society, right? And for company, company would benefit us who start having all the different type of talent, okay, creativity and ability that they would get from having a diverse type of people. So that's the way that we would look at it. So call it inclusive, call it equality, call it diversity. And those three come in together, right? Hmm. So we need to have that communication, have that dialogue, and have that uh, happen. And, and by we have to start talking about it, and that's why I talk about accessibility when it comes to people like me. Mm -hmm. But accessibility applies not just to people like me, it applies to everybody. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. Do you find, um, in the same way that companies release uh, diversity data on race, that they're releasing salary data? According to diversity, because I think you know, that's the other part of the equity scale. Yeah. You know, it's nice to know that we have a diverse um, workforce, but what are we paying them? Because yeah. that is, like, the onus of salary is on the, you know, applicant. Yes. And I feel like yes. the minority group may have less uh, affordability, you know, in that negotiation factor yeah. for time and to hold out for the salary that uh, they want. Because I'm just wondering, have you encountered data that speaks to you know what minorities have paid at the companies that have a minority workforce? Um, yeah, I did. I've seen two that come to mind. I can't really place where, but um, one was saying that you know the in in essence, it seemed to be saying that um, there were particular underrepresented groups that were more prone to take, you know, kind of their reasoning was take a lower sal. Their explanation was take a lower salary, get the job, you know, just nail just something down kind of thing. Um, and so not having, right, it, and I, I don't think this particular survey teased apart, you know, were, were there skills in negotiating, were there, um, I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, maybe Facebook, Google have r released some data about, you know, pay equity for women. Uh, I don't know if it's been done along racial, uh, ethnic lines. Um, but yeah, and and. What is the first thing that thought as well? Hmm. I think if you're just intentional, I don't know what it is you're doing, if you're intentional on making it known that you're looking for diversity, you have to literally be intentional about it. Um, and then huh. stepping out of your box and your comfort zone as to where you're looking for your help. Um, as crazy as it may seem in the technology industry, everyone's not privy to the having the technology to find the job, but they have the knowledge and the skill set, but they don't always have a way to find it. So if you're just figuring out ways to get to those disadvantaged people or people who have the skill set but don't know how because they don't get taught how to figure out where to find those jobs, that would help too. And I would also add to that, um, one of my friends and my cousin works in IT and 
they intentionally didn't put their ethnic, ethnicity on their application um, because they don't know if they're going to be looked at and not given the given the opportunity because they're qualified or not qualified. And so he went to the University of Wisconsin, which is, you know, big cheese state, um, but he got a job, he loves it, he's in San Diego, um, but the company that he works at believes in diversity and that's part of their culture. And I think it really comes down to what the company's culture and their values are, and then that's reflective in how they execute things. And then, like you said, you surround yourself with diverse people, um, it's kind of like a, a tag you're it kind of thing. Like if that's what you're fostering, other people are going to foster that as well. And then it's not just all on like the head of the right. company. Yeah. So you know? I have an opportunity to, I say like wipe that question off the, yeah. the entry point. I really hate that question. Worry about it. But then, you know, like I, I have the opportunity to do that. And if I can be, if I can influence other people to do the same thing, right. that's a, probably a good place to start. And another example is my friend, um, he's the owner of an educational platform, I don't know what it's called, it's called Bridge Prep Solutions, and what he's done, um, all of his employees work remote, they're international, and he's taken off ethnicity, um, gender, and something else on there, um, and he's just, he has like key questions that he wants to have, for example, like the person at Polytech um, that didn't all get the degree but has the skills. Um, he has certain questions that meet the criteria for what he's hiring for, and he goes to different pockets. So like, for example, he has an ad on Career Contessa, which is a female-oriented website for women to get jobs. He has a job posting on, I think it's NSBE or National Association of Black Engineers, and then he has a posting on another website that's for all minorities and disadvantaged, or, um, people that need accessibility and that's how he's like picking out employees based on those skills rather than trying to like fit them in yeah. those holes. Yeah. And that might be something you can try and do. And yeah. it'd be less work on your part because a lot of people they might know one website or something like that. I don't know. Well I I'm getting the signal to no, no, no. can I ask a question? Oh no <laughs> But, okay. Um, I was. I, I think in in building a team and and, and hiring a team, um, I was fortunate enough to learn in a corporate environment from a wonderful manager, and I, and, I, and I've had a wide I had a wide variety of managers, but one in particular was a very good at talking to us as junior people who would eventually move up the ladder talking to us about diversity, about the importance of bringing so many different points of view together. And I think as a hiring manager and as a, you know, owner of a small business, I think it's important to not only Certainly, look, like we've been talking about, look, look who you're hiring, but also the people you're already working with, talk to them about being inclusive, being empathetic, being uh, open to new ideas. Because when you do have a lot of different ideas, there's a lot more conflict, but it usually results in more interesting ideas mm -hmm. and a really good product. And, like I said, I learned that from that manager really early in my career, and it made a big impact than when I went to other managers who had more uh, closed off points of view. Yeah. And so I think that's in addition to hiring, you know, looking out to, to new people, you need to talk to your existing people too. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, you got, you got a couple minutes. And then we'll yeah, I mean, I, I just feel that um, whatever, however you want to phrase it, but the quality of being uh, empathetic, of listening, of trying to build that, um, I think that's an important and maybe a skill that you should, that I would say people should hire upon because a lot of times um, you know, I can't tell you how many times that, you know, you'll get into a technical discussion 
and it's really the person who kind of builds the bridge that says, well, okay, I see your point, but we need to, it, whatever it is, then that's really the thing that gets a product out the door. And I think that if you're, you know, I, I really think that the contribution, one contribution that will be talked about maybe 50, 100 years hence, in terms of automatic, is the ability and maybe other companies too, just to create a wide-ranging distributed you know, workforce in a way that's, and hopefully at the end of it, uh, that's equitable. And I think that those kinds of things don't happen by accident. And you, like you said, you have to, uh, you have to go out and find the, the, the manager that you mentioned, you know. And, you know, as people, Eventually, we go into management too. Right, right. I think that's, yeah. I want to just piggyback off like, the conversation about um, being intentional and just um, making sure that messaging is out there so that I know the, the workload is on you to go out and see someone, but also if you're looking for people to apply, just that in that messaging, um, stating that you're diversity minded so that. I know in applying for jobs, no one's going to say we don't like this group of people. But if you, you may be, um, what am I trying to say? Uh, lost the words. Um, like uh, overwhelmed at the idea or um, feeling like you may not belong there if you're looking at the present team or something like that. And um, if you go, we're diversity minded. These are the things that we're looking for, and we're open to accepting all these types of people. Then the person won't feel as though they don't belong, and they'll they'll be uh, it won't be as scary to apply to whatever position it is. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A applying for a job is scary enough. You know, why are you gonna? You know, it shouldn't be an open question about whether I'll be included there or not. Intimidating. Yeah, intimidating. Exactly. Yeah. Oh. Marvelous. Well, uh, well, yeah, I think if I leave you with anything, it's that first line up there that it's not as visible as I want it to be, but it's cultivate empathy. And I think of the, you know, the story of your manager and the story of, you know, coming to apply for a job and am I going to be accepted as I am? Um, you know, all of those things, the degree to which we can just remove those barriers and, um, you know, a a and, and make it as open and, you know, open to the challenge of, you know, pulling through more applicants. You know, that's a good problem, right? I mean, you know, if everybody's there, then you can say, oh, you know, this is a skill I value, and you can you can make better choices. You can make you have larger options. Um, so that's the thing I would encourage: cultivate em empathy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.